Hey, this is Match once again. Welcome back to another video. There's another paid request this time for Andrew. Thank you for that. If it was interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, topics, reactions, commentaries, wherever it may be, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. It could be for pretty much anything. And Andrew wanted me to do a commentary at Gross Point Blank, a 1997 film which I do highly enjoy. If I seem a bit prickish today, it's because some fucking idiot in a tractor apparently went by and knocked over my mailbox and broke it, so now I have to somehow get someone to fix it or whatever, so that's a great pain in the ass. Fucking bullshit. I, I, I hate this place. But anyway, let's get into this. I have a pause at the beginning for those who want to follow along. Three, two, one, pressing play. And here we have uh, Hollywood Pictures. A nickname that was given to that was the Sphinx that stinks because so many films that were released under that bombed. And there were a lot of good films that were released under it, but not a lot of big hits. Even this film wasn't a hit. I mean, it made maybe $28 million in the U.S. I mean, that's not really a big hit, but it got a lot of good critical notices. 87% Rotten Tomatoes. And love the movie. It's, <clears throat> it's tongue in cheek quality. It's quirky and funny. The cast are fantastic. The soundtrack is wonderful. George Armitage, the director, the thing is, he just did a couple films in the 1970s. Including Hitman with Bernie Casey. He did one called Vigilante Force with Chris Christopherson. And then he did, in 1990, Miami Blues with Alec Baldwin, which I could not get into. And after this, he only did one more movie, The Big Bounce with Owen Wilson. But that's he hasn't done a lot. And of the films I've seen, this is definitely his best. John Tuzet is this Hitman, whose assistant is played by his... Family member Joan Cusack. <clears throat> I mean, you look at this cast. You got John and Joan Cusack. You got Dan Aykroyd. You got Hank Azaria. Minnie Driver, who was in Goodwill Hunting. Mitchell Ryan, that name appears. He was McAllister, the bad guy in the first Lethal Weapon. And there's a lot of good movies in 1997. Drive with Martha Costos is one. Mimic, I enjoy. The Relic, I enjoy. Con Air, I enjoy. Fifth Element, I love. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's a guy on a bicycle trying to kill someone, and John John Tuse hit that guy. <laughs> Steve Pink was one of the co-producers. Steve Pink would later, I believe, direct Hot Tide Temp. Hot Tub Time Machine with John Cusack in it. But oh, there's Dan Aykroyd going to take the hit away from him. <laughs> I guess Dan Aykroyd just making absolutely sure that the guy's dead. <laughs>
<laughs> Danicor is a lot of fun in this too, as these two cautious, paranoid hitmen. <laughs> <laughs> Even this cautious way of standing like they're on guard the whole time. Like they're both ready to kill the other at any minute now. At this point from the get-go, it's just such a fun but weird energy to it where it's like a different take on Hitman where it's fairly comedic. I mean, there are killers, there are murderers, but at the same time, there's a weird like likability to them. And the dialogue is very witty, very snappy. And Dad definitely knows how to unleash this jargon. From back to the day of Ghostbusters, all this scientific jargon here. It can really let that dialogue flow out. Get what? Get back. And the whole time, like, they're so cautious. Like, they know one's going to turn on the other at any minute now. And by this point, Dan Aykroyd, I mean, he wasn't getting a lot of big roles in movies. I mean, it was, like, small bits in films like Evolution after this, or... Probably a few years before he was in that film Sneakers. Or that terrible film with Rosie O'Donnell. Where, uh, I forgot what the hell it was called. They went to the S&M Island. <laughs> Man, back in the day when you had faxes in your cars. Nowadays you just send it <laughs> via the phone iPhone, cell phone, however you want to put it. <laughs> of course, Joan Q's at... Yeah, she's done stuff with John. I mean, this there's kind of a sequel called War, Inc., I say kind of, because they're not the same characters, but it has the same feeling where John is an assassin, Joan is the assistant. Dan Aykroyd was in that film as well, so it's kind of like a spiritual sequel to this. Not as good as this, but I remember not minding War Inc. for what it is. But this one just has a, like I said, a very interesting soundtrack. I always thought this was kind of a creative way to kill someone where this like poison or whatever, acid or poison, I forget which one, to go right into the guy's mouth. I'm like, that is really, that's like a hitman, you know, Agent 47 type of stuff. <laughs> I need to try to remember if it was poison or acid. I would imagine poison. I can't remember. I think doesn't he turn and it misses the mouth or something? I th then I think he just comes in and shoots him or something. It's been a while since I've seen this, but I do remember liking this quite a bit. Yeah, the only issue with this is it takes a bit 
uh, a theater draw. I have a long while to do it. <laughs> do it the old fashioned way. There you go. And as he puts it there, it stopped me. I'm not the one who wants this, I'm just doing a job. So I understand the director gave a lot of freedom to the script for people to play it with, like play it mild or play it much big, bigger than usual, and usually the much bigger than usual tapes were the ones used. Kind of reminds me of what Dan, uh, Stanley Kubrick did with Dr. Strangelove, like George C. Scott got upset with him because Stanley Kubrick would go, okay, do one big, George, George C. Scott, do one a big take, okay. And that's like that's all the taste George, <laughs> that uh, Stanley Tuber used. And then Joyce's guy was pissed off about it, but <laughs> see, so he was supposed to look like a heart had died in sleep, but. <laughs> to go back home and delete someone while you were there <laughs> I mean sorry it's not a talk to a commentary but the movie pretty much speaks for itself I mean Like you said, the, the dialogue is well delivered, the cast are game. I, I, I guess I don't really know what he wants out of this commentary. I'll do my best, though. Even this whole thing with the shrink is kind of like a precursor to... Well, not precursor, but... Reminds me of analyze that or analyze this. Which was first? Analyze this or analyze that? That's the thing with those tiles, like you don't even can't analyze this was first, it was after this. So I wonder if someone thought of an idea like, hey, look at this and And this Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin is a lot of fun. He worked with John Cusack in a film called America's Sweethearts. And Alan Arkin has done a lot of stuff, but he's a lot of fun in this. But you tell he doesn't want to deal with this guy because he's a hitman, he's a killer, he's steered, he's nervous about it, but at the same time... <laughs> for four sessions. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice thing to say where I live that was a nice thing to say <laughs> <laughs> I have a tray of an interesting way or you don't blow my brains out.
I think they put up this crucifix just hoping he doesn't get killed. So he's been having dreams of Debbie, this girl from back in the day, who is played by Minnie Driver, which we'll see later in the film. <laughs> it's a depressing dream, the, the dream about the, the, the bunny, the battery bunny. Keep going and going. It's depressing about that dream. He's got no brains. <laughs> That's for me. Like the dialogue is just refreshing and fun to listen to. Just refreshing, and fun to listen to. And <laughs> no, no, don't give it a shot. Don't shoot anything. <laughs> And this thing, when the action scenes do happen, they're well done. Like the grocery store shootout, which you'll see the uh, the Benny the Jet fight. Here, Dan Aykroyd's got his his uh, job taken. <laughs> <laughs> Just a fun different role for Dan Aykroyd. Ah, uh, yes. I always enjoyed this song. I always thought it fit well. Blister in the Sun by the Violent Films. I think this was used a lot of the marketing as well. But yeah, I thought this song fit very well. Yeah, Blister in the Sun. I don't know why you changed it to a shittier song. Well, you had a good song, then why you change it to a shitty song? So now you have these two guys. One of them is Hank Azaria. Hank Azaria, he did a lot of voice work on The Simpsons. He was in the Godzilla 1998 movie. He was in The Birdcage. I think he was in America's Sweethearts. I could be wrong. The other guy, his name is Kate Todd Freeman. And see what else he's been in. Let's see. FBI agent eraser? Okay, it's weird. He says he was Bastard Stottman in the 2014 Ninja Turtles film, but I don't know what they're talking about. I don't remember a Stottman. What, was he a guy like on TV or something? I didn't notice. I don't know. But yeah, here's Mini Driver as Debbie. I say I think the most famous film she was in was Goodwill Hunting. Which is around the same time. I mean, I think the same year, actually, 97. The same year. And then after that, 
she was the voice of Jane Porter in that Tarzan movie by a Disney. Hard Rain she was in with Patricia Slater. That's a film I enjoy. I, I, it'd be nice to see that re-released on Blu-ray. And I don't know, a lot of films I don't recognize. Return to Zero, I Give It a Year, Barney's Version, Motherhood, Ripple Effect, 2004's Phantom of the Opera, Slow Burn, Beautiful. Return to Me, that was a romantic film she did with David Duchovny. But yeah, just after 2000, she kind of just did a lot of smaller independent work. This is just a weird story, like a hip man going back to his high school reunion, and you see all these other people, you know, they draw on to do these quaint jobs, but then this one guy just became a fucking hip man. An assassin, I should say. Okay. And the thing with this assassin, if I remember, he does freelance where he accepts contracts on corrupt individuals. Like his own to rationalize it. That's what we got Live and Let Die by Guns N' Roses. I said, There's his home. It was a convenience store. <laughs> to the tune of Live and Let Die by Guns N' Roses. Live and Let Die. Originally by Paul McCartney for the James Bond film Live and Let Die, but redone for Guns N' Roses redid it. <laughs> and yeah, as soon as he went in, just the mute just cut off. And this is a nice little addition, you got Doom 2 arcade game back there. <laughs> like John Hughes just cannot fathom and understand that his home his childhood home is gone and his, this convenience store is taking its place he just cannot fathom that idea <laughs> <laughs> now it makes me wonder the idea the doctor is sleeping there because the guy thread to get about his home that maybe he feels safer at his office <laughs> but maybe that's why he's sleeping This is a bit sad from what I remember. The mom is here. I don't think she like... Somehow she doesn't remember much or something. Or maybe she does.
-hmm. Yeah, taking lithium. <laughs> Jesus. Now, John Tuza is an actor who, which I do enjoy. I mean, the guy, for some reason, hates most of his films. This is, like, one of the few films. This, High Fidelity, maybe one or two others that he actually likes, but he's always so harsh on his own films, I don't know why. Even though, I think he's done a lot of great stuff. I mean, I look at his filmography, he was in 16 Candles, Better Off Dead, despite how much he hates it, great movie. He was in Stand By Me. Stuff like... This and Con Air were in the same year, and I think it's two of his best films. And after that, he was in The Thin Red, Thin Red Line, which I enjoy. I liked America's Sweethearts. 1408 is one of my favorites. 2012 is fun for what it is. It's Grand Piano, that's a good one. That's the one no one talks about. How to Time Machine was fun. I mean, if you want to talk about his worst one, Cell, I think, is his worst one. He had Cameo in Hot Tide Time Machine 2, and that was an awful movie. Drive Hard with Thomas Jane. That was a very disappointing film. Because he got two actors that are fairly good, but wasted in a crappy flick. And that's his dad. Died, was it 1989, it said, or something? At least take the bottle with you, man. Well, I would say if I did a top five favorite con uh, John Cusack films, one is Con Air. That's number one. But number two, I'm going to say 428. I do enjoy that film quite a bit. Three, I'll say this one, Gross Point Blank. Four, Better Off Dead. Do I do I like this or Better Off Dead more? Hmm. <clears throat> I would say this because it has a bit of that action feel to it. I'm a action film, big action film fan. But at Gross Point Blank Three, Better Off Dead Four, and Argo and Sweethearts Five, because that's a film no one talks about. But that was a charming little film. No, I take that back. I'll go 2012. No. Hmm. Metro Sweethearts 2012, Grand Piano. It's between them. I, I don't know which one. But when he got in the, the 2012s, 2013s, there was a lot of these directed video films like The Factory, The Number Station, all this stuff that just came into to play. That are either just forgettable, or maybe tolerable, or maybe just, just lame. Like, the number station, I remember being, meh. Like, tolerable for what it is. But not great in any sl any step of the imagination. Now, of course, the whole deal is that she, he had abandoned her at prom night, and then I guess he went to the army or something, but he abandoned her at prom night, so she's a bit miffed about that. But it's also sort of the, the road less traveled motif. Like, what if he had gone in this direction and went her, with her on prom night? Fall even more in love, maybe a lot more could have been coming to play.
<laughs> but I mean, you think John Cusa, I mean, he's an actor that's been around for a while, but he was never like a big box office star, if you think about it, other than maybe Con Air, Fortune Away, 2012. 16 Candles Back to the Day. Hot Tub Time Machine. That was what, five I named or something? It's a very playful energy to the movie where despite it being serious with you know an assassin type of motif, it's still this playful quality to the characters to the the dialogue. <coughs> Looking at the critic reviews, a high concept high school reunion movie with an at a jo a jo a jointly I don't even know what the hell that word means. Adroitly cast John Tuzet and armed with a script of incisive wit. Peter Travers praises the writing as smart, but not smart ass. Smashing action scenes that reveal character. Furthermore, he praises Ackroy and the tally cast of small supporting roles. Flies on Tuzet's seductive malevolence. Again, it's just, they don't really make, I mean, I've always talked about how, you know, films back then were so much better than today, and I agree. I mean, whether you want to talk about comedy or whatever, I can't remember the last comedy that was worth a spit, among other films, or that was as witty or clever like a film in this nature. I just don't see it. Well, he'll make you bait for your life if you knew what job he was. <laughs> Show taste. Who the hell is this guy? Michael An Mighty from Ninja Turtles? Hey, dude. What's going on, dude? <coughs> <laughs> Now, I looked at 1997, and it's like, right from the beginning, January, Jackie Chan's first strike, very fun action film, The Relic, love that monster movie. I mean, not a fan of Turbulence, but, Beverly Hills Ninja, entertaining Chris Farley movie, a comedy. Metro, underrated action film with Eddie Murphy. I mean, January of 97, you had Gridlock I liked with Tupac. And that's we had the special editions of Star Wars. There's Benny the Jet. Our first appearance of Benny the Jet Ortiz. Benny the Jet trained John Tuzak in a bit of martial arts for the movie. Uh, Benny the Jet would also... He worked with Jackie Chan on films. Was it Wheels on Meals, among others. And there's his childhood friend. Played by Jeremy Piven. Jeremy... That's another doctor that's been in a lot of stuff, Jeremy Piven. I mean, he was in 
I remember him from Judgment Night with Emilio Estevez. Jeremy Piven was a lot of stuff. He was in... I forgot he was in One Crazy Summer with John Cusack. I forgot about that. <clears throat> Let's see, he was also... The like, Judgment Night, underrated film. Heat. He had a good scene with Robert De Niro. I'm twice the worst dude you'd ever have. Kiss the Girls? I forgot he was in Kiss the Girls. Oh yeah, he was a salesman in Rush Hour 2. That's right, I remember that. <clears throat> the Teen Dem from 2007. That's a pretty good movie. But yeah, 1997, I mean, this was, a, a to me, a good year for movies. I, all that stuff was in January that I mentioned before. And you know, I love Volcano. I love Con Air. I love... Just my memory's going. Fifth Element I love. You know, Donnie Brasco, that's a good dramatic movie. Private Parts, that could be a fun comedy with Howard Stern. Liar Liar, very f that's a very fun comedy. And Coast Boy and Blank gets a 7.3 and I'm to be. So pretty high rating, respectable rating I'm to be. I think that guy, Terry, I think that's Steve Pink, the guy who directed Hot Tub Time Machine. I believe that's the same guy. And Steve Pink, he produced High Fidelity. He helped produce this film and helped write it. And a day he directed Hot Tub Time Machine, About Last Night, Hot Tub Time Machine 2. Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> I'm laughing at Jeremy Piven just exasperation but it's like the fast been 10 years since they've seen each other Uh, back to the day, those old, old school computers. I mean, computers were a different animal in 97 compared to today. I mean, 97, when this came out, I would have been 83, 93. I would have been in middle school still. So, I probably... I probably... I didn't see this when it came out. I probably saw this years later. I'm trying to think. Maybe on a table or something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing. The Joe is a different role for Joan Tuzak as well. I remember the most from Toys or Robert Williams, but it's just a lot of fun to see her play that type of role. But she's been in other stuff. She was in School of Rock with Jab Black. She was in Voice of Jesse in Toy Story 2, Adam's Family Values. <clears throat> I have a guy playing Doom 2. The Ace of Space. The Ace of Space. Motorhead. Here you get this action bit. <laughs> There's Benny the Jet versus John Tuzat gunplay wise. That's a pretty heavy duty machine machine gun play. It's funny, because of the different use of angles, the good sound effects, there's also those all those little explosions for each thing that gets shot. You have to put a little explosive squib on each one to make it simulate all that stuff being blown up and shot at. That's a lot of work to get into play there. <laughs> Bomb in a microwave. <clears throat> And John Tews actually tries to write, you know, does the right thing, saves this guy. Fucking C4. <laughs> now, I don't know where the hell they landed. But, uh, it's like they landed in like a... <laughs> Obviously, of course, they were done different days. That big explosion will shoot one day. And then after this, just do a flip and probably some person will just throw in some shit. <laughs> well, how about I thank you for being alive?
dickwad. That'd be nice. Some bitch. Sorry, I had to respond to something. I, I apologize too with the just that fucking idiot just running over the goddamn mailbox. This guy's must have been a dr he driving his tractor drone, drunk driving tractor style. There you go. That sounds like something to be on fucking Reno nine one one. That fucking idiot. God. Da -da -da -da. Fucking dirt bay dickwad. Sorry. <laughs> Get back to the commentary. And these two have some good chemistry with each other. I do think they did a nice job with that. Oh shit. Yeah, these guys is definitely people you don't want to... Yeah, not likelihood to trust in any way, shape, or fashion. Yeah. 
great stealth masters. You're all Sam Fishers. You want to shoot him so badly when you shoot him right now, Dan Aykroyd? Fuck you waiting for. <laughs> so of course the idea of Dan Aykroyd hired these guys to try to fuck with. This is all these things like Benny Jed, Dan Aykroyd, these two government guys, among others just getting in the way of him establishing this love story again. Again, I apologize, it's just I'm not sure what else to, to talk about in the film. It just, like I said before, it very speaks for itself. So, and yeah, I know it's not the most exciting commentary. I'll talk whatever the hell I want to talk. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'll do what the fuck I want. Yeah, if you say so. Damn, does... Do you ever go home? Or do you sleep there? <laughs> Damn, Joan Cusack. Damn, that's a really shitty picture for Hedges area. All American wrestler. What's that? So it wanna be American gladiators? Yeah, and then some. Man, what a name. Felix La Poubelle. Get some great poupon. <laughs> That's where I know him from. He's an asshole. <laughs> But yeah, Benny the Jet, that's who we're talking about. American kickboxer, nicknamed the, like, the Jet, non-contact karate competitor. Transitioned to full contact karate in 1974. Six world titles in five different weight divisions and remained largely undefeated in his 27-year career. His only loss came in a Muay Thai match, which was shrouded in controversy as Benny the Jet had only agreed to a no decision exhibition, a clause which was ignored when the fight had ended. Hmm. 49-1-1, one one, 35 knockouts, 2 controversial no contests. He was competitor of the year in Black Belt and Magazine, 1978. Movie roles, he was in, <coughs> sorry, Force 5 with Joe Lewis, which you can find trails of that on YouTube. Jackie Chan film Wheels on Meals, as well as Dragons Forever. Yeah, cameo in the trauma film Raging Cajun, Jesus. 
He helped train Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. He has a cameo in the 94 Street Fire, one of the prisoners in a truck with Ken Ryu. He played a referee in the James Woods film Digstown. He's used as longtime tip boxing trainer. He's one of the thugs who were caused Kirsten Dunst's character in the first Spider Man. I didn't know that. Huh. Interesting. But yeah. Bailey the Jet, he's not a guy to mess with. Now it says screenwriter Tom Jankowicz. Jo Tom Jankowicz has done a lot of stuff throughout the years. Or am I thinking of someone else? Nah, maybe I'm thinking of someone else. Sorry. He hasn't done a lot. I lied. He wrote... It's mainly this, so I was thinking of someone else. He wrote the script in 1991 after receiving an invitation to his 10th high school reunion. He pit the film's title while... while... Substitute teaching for an English class at Upland High School by writing the title on the classroom's whiteboard to see how it would look on a movie theater. Gross Point, an upscale Michigan suburb rather than his working class hometown of Sterling Heights due to the contrast between the two towns. He was a substitute teacher and a cashier at Big Lots before his script was picked up for production. He based many of his characters on real-life friends from Michigan. Jeremy Piven's character was originally named after his best friend during high school. The name was changed during filming, though. Shared co writing credits with John Tuesday, Steve Pink, and D.V. DeVincentis. Don't know how to pronounce that. He spent the next 15 years writing newspaper articles and working as an advertising copywriter. He worked as a script doctor, editing and improving screenplays written by other screenwriters. He sold a spec script in 2000 called Kung Fu Theater. A combination of Enter the Dragon and Pleasantville follows the story of a slacker who becomes trapped in a Kung Fu movie from the 70s. The comedy's picked up by DreamWorks with Marlon Wayans and Jamie Foxx attached to star at one point but remained in development. I never heard about that. Enter the Dragon meets Pleasantville. That'd be kind of funny. A slacker stuck in a Kung Fu movie. That'd be kind of funny, actually. George, the director, said, I did as much as anyone did in terms of writing. The strict one I met with John Tuesday and the writers was 132 pages. I said, look, I'm not doing anything over 100 pages. They said, okay, and they did a rewrite. It came by 150 pages. So I said, okay, you guys are fired. And I spent most of the pre-production rewriting the screenplay, getting it down to 102 pages. Then we could improvise, and I noticed that some of the stuff I cut out was in the improvs. They were bringing back stuff that I cut out, but we had a good time with it. <laughs> Again, each time these two are together, there's always this anxiety and paranoia on guard. Dan Aykroyd definitely got a bit of dreadnet in that speech. Listen to all that stuff in the diner. <laughs> I think this is one of my favorite lines by Dan Aykroyd. It's like, go shoot your head and fuck the bullet hole.
<laughs> These two definitely work well together. Nice snap back and forth between the two. See you, Dali. <laughs> oh, fuck the brain hole. <laughs> Hey, sorry about that. I had to do something, but I'm paused at one hour, two minutes, and 40 seconds in. Three, two, one, pressing play. So, pretty much, he's on the phone getting ready for his reunion. Nervous as can be. And I actually watch this again. I, I would, I would put Better Off Dead above this. The more I think about it, it would be for John Tuesday films Con Air, 4208, and then Better Off Dead. Because Better Off Dead, I do think, is funnier than this. Although I do enjoy the film. But Better Off Dead is a bit more underrated as well. I mean, in a weird way, if you change a couple things, this would be a sequel to Better Off Dead. The character was so eccentric in killing himself, trying to kill himself, that he went off to be a hitman. <laughs> Too many bumps during those steam <laughs> segments. <laughs> no, that's you loading a gun. I'm a pressure. I'm a pressure. Professional killer, what do you do? Stick finger, 
Feed yourself to assholes. Oh, you're a doctor. <clears throat> she thinks he's holding him up, holding her up again when he's on his way. Eighty-eight, six, high school reunion. That's I think Betty the Jet realizing that. That's where you get a little bit of fight scene during the school. I mean, just, you know, I think about the films of nowadays, and I do think a lot of them, like someone mentioned this before, a lot of films nowadays is in the realm of quantity over quality, where there's so many more films being made today than there were back then, because all these streaming services need content, whether it be Netflix, whether it be Disney+, Plus, whether it be now Paramount Network, all this stuff, and... You know, back then, you know, you'd have a certain number of films in theaters, maybe a certain number of th films direct to video, but now it's just consistent amount of content that needs to be put out there to be, hopefully, bring revenue up for a streaming platform. And it doesn't matter if it's good, if it's bad, if it's indifferent, if it's you know, ninety minutes or whatever. Not even them. I mean, some less some, as long as it's a movie of short, movie of short, and not just you know twenty minutes long, or then they'll take it. I believe there's a lot of garbage. Amityville, Karen, Amityville in space, all this junk that comes out, and it just back then there's a bit more quality work. I mean, people always talk about you know the great of the seventies. For me, it's the eighties and nineties. You know, the 90s gets a bad rap as a decade. And I would say the 90s is the most underrated decade when it comes to films. Because people talk about how, oh, there's so many bad horror films. But I'm like, no. I mean, that has Jacob's Ladder. That has Blair Witch Project. That has films like The Relic and Deep Rising and Tremors and, you know, Exorcist 3 and Sounds of the Lambs and Stream and all sorts of stuff. Now this song here, this is from Faith No More, called We Care A Lot, and the song's dissipating now, but that song is the opening of Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. It's a dirty job, but someone's gotta do it, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, but it's part of that song that was just playing a minute ago. Well, it's playing now still. You can barely hear it, though, to be fair. Whoa, whoa, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. Yeah, you hear a lot more now. It was kind of, the music was a bit suppressed for a bit, but. But yeah, a lot of quantity over quality back then. Whether it be, like, comedies. Even you films like Pleasantville and this movie, there's inventiveness, there's creative qualities put into it. Now, not really. It's either boring, pretentious A24 horror films that you've seen done ten times and people think it's new for some reason. Or the next typical generic Marvel superhero movie. Or... I don't even know what you have for comedies and all this other stuff. Get another fun piece of music. Take on me. Aha. Uh -huh. That's the one that had that music video that was interesting, like a 
kind of like a comic book come to life type of animation. On me, take on me. But yeah, they graduate from 86, which would be one of the best years for movies. Aliens, Big Trouble in Little China, The Fly, Golden Child, Short Circuit, I think uh, Crocodile Dundee, a lot of stuff. And there's also this fun bit where we, the audience, know who this guy is, what he can do, his background, at least a bit more. And, but just how blind everyone else is. They think he's just a regular guy they knew ten years ago. But no one's going to know that he's a you know, professional killer. Now, this woman here is Jenna Elfman. I think this might have been the first film she had done. She would later find success in a film, a show, I should say, called Dharma and Grade. Which, I don't remember how long that lasted. I think she was in a bit role in a film called Can't Hardly Wait. But Dharma and Grade, I think, came out the same year, 97. And lasted until 2002. She had Golden Globe Award for Best Actress. Three nominations for Emmys for Lead Actress in a Comedy. But, I mean, as for movies, she was in Trippendorf Tribe. That was a really bad one with Richard Dreyfus. I guess she was in the Eddie Murphy, Dr. Doolittle. Oh, yeah, I think she was a voice in that. Ed TV, Matthew McConaughey. That's a Ron Howard film that bombed. Because, honestly, the Truman Show had come out was a much better movie than that. Keeping the Faith, that was with Edward Norton and Ben Stiller. Town and Country was a huge bomb, Warren Beatty joint. Looney Tunes Back in Atcha, that was another big, that's, that's, yeah, a series of bombs. Again, Ed TV bomb, Keeping the Faith, I don't know, Town, Town and Country I know bomb, Looney Tunes Back in Atcha bombed. You know, this series of bombs pretty much killed her career. Because after those, Touched, What's Hip Doc, 2008 Struck, and The Six Wives of Harry Le Fay, Love Hurts. She was in Friends with Benefits, 2011, which I remember not mining for what it was. Big Stone Gap, 2014, Barry, 2016, films I never heard of. By this, she was Fear the Walking Dead. She was in 35 episodes of that. And then Talking Dead, okay. Didn't know she was on that show. Proud to watch it, so. Of course, another great song, Under Pressure, by Queen. Under Pressure. This is definitely a nice, sweet scene. See, scenes like this give it a nice heart to it, where he looks at this kid, and one of the things that changes his mind and what he wants to do with his life. <laughs> Great song, David Bowie, Queen under it. And this cute baby as well. Like they did the cutest baby. <laughs> and I like they let the moment grow. It wasn't just a quick aside, it's just they literally let it seep in 
John looked at the baby, the baby looked at him, John looked at the baby, then the baby smiled at him, and then they use a different angle for each one. I'm glad they let that sink in to give, like, this is a nice pivotal, pivotal moment for the John Cusack character. <laughs> So that was very nice. That that worked ra that worked rather well for the the film. Bobby Beamer. Why well, you really beamish? You make the girl squeamish. Baba Bobby. So this guy is Michael Cudlitz. He was also on the walk. He was on The Walking Dead. He was also on TV show Band of Brothers, Southland. There's a lot of TV work. He was in D3: The Mighty Ducks. 2006 film Running Steered, which that's an underrated film with Paul Walker. Yeah, another great song, Pete Townsend. You hear a bit in the background. Let my love open the door to your heart. Uh, that a soundtrack does help. People don't understand how much a soundtrack can really help a film too. How the using all the senses, of course, your visual cortex, but also these songs that elicit some kind of emotional reaction or nostalgia or just the right feeling for the scene. <clears throat> and, you know, that song's been used a lot. It was in Look Who's Talking, Mr. D's, it was in that. I want, I think, uh, yeah, Jersey Girl was in that Kevin Smith movie. I think Along Came Polly was in it. A lot of movies, especially comedies, but... <clears throat> and that's a nice sweet scene. Open the door. Open the door. <laughs> and you know things are going well before the sandstorm shifts in to bury all good intentions so to speak I don't know this song. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, is it Whoopi Goldberg's The Telephone's favorite film? Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, nah. I mean, see you off to have sex, but it's like, cot stopper. Yeah, come on, man, let me get my dick wet. What are you doing? What are you doing, lady? What are you doing, you doing? I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait for shit. Just let me do what I want to do. <laughs> Big old slap and a welcome home to boot.
think most guys would wish that luck. You get slapped and then you get immediately into his sex. Into the sex. <clears throat> Yeah, that fucking easy to get into the damn thing for crying out loud. <laughs> didn't, didn't take much effort to do that. Oh, you don't want to pick on this guy, asshole. Just leave him alone. Walk on. Leave him alone. <laughs> and nice kind of fun change of events that you know the guy the bullies wanting to use his words is more uh, more of a sentiment than you would think <laughs> <laughs> this guy's drunk off his rock or two. Full wow, good. Steep, man. Truman Capote. Full wow. Do you blow? Go ahead, blow your brains out with that blow in the bathroom. Drunk people can be some weird cats, man. They want to punch you and then they want to crawl on your shoulder in a matter of minutes. <laughs> Ah, uh, this is where you get to the bending to the jet scene. Which locker is this for? Oh, I guess his old locker and Oh, he had something there for the longest of time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Pretty decent fight scene. I mean, we got Benny the Jet to help you out. It's... There you go. Gouge for the eyes. Good elbow. Ooh, nice side kick. Very nice. There's some nice tits there. Ooh, good lead sw sweep though by Betty the Jet. Nice takedown. There you go. Just straddle and punch the shit out of him. Oh, get some bite in there, yeah. There you go. Capture the arms to give some big old punches. Oh, there you go. Ooh, right in the jugular with the pen. 
There you go. <laughs> Good job. <coughs> <laughs> I would have said like self-defense, but that would have been my go-to line. And there's Jeremy Piven again. <laughs> that's a good friend without much question you help him wrap a dead body now that's a friend after 10 years you able to do that that is a pretty crazy friend <laughs> it's the music too the music choice that makes it funnier about this <laughs> oh just a carpet so it's just a carpet <laughs> was it an incinerator or something or just put it here in the trash Yeah, it is incinerator. <laughs> See, my school never had an incinerator like this. I mean, this is Freddy Krueger boiler room style. I'm sure that smell of burning flesh is going to be glorious. <laughs> Definitely a different mood. For Jeremy Piven's character, it's a completely different mood. You know, club soda. Kind of in a way, this is a club soda as well, in a way. <laughs> so that's where you got the pen from Does he fire him at this point? <laughs> I 
the other way out of Arkin just busting his shit out of the phone. <laughs> Alan Arkin didn't want to be a part of this, just leave him alone. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's why you don't want to look through the people, because you always go like this and be like... So I'm just enjoying the dialogue. Again, the actors are just committed, both John Cusack, Mini Driver. You're trained to do it, you know how to do it, and you get to even liking doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a best kill for no reason. I do it for money. It's a job. And you look at John Tuza, his eyes, all that stuff about a guy who's just on his last end, just in a way wanting to get out, wanting to stop, and finding his way out through this lady. And you can't really blame her reaction, like you just told this guy who left you at the prom ten years ago, joined the army, worked for the government, and now kills people <laughs> as an assassin, trying to corrupt people what he says but still it's, it's not really something to swallow easily in 10 seconds <laughs> so yeah I can't really blame her for in her reaction <laughs> at least I mean not to be I guess I can't really blame her <laughs> Just tear the whole fucking place apart. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much he quit the business, gave Joan Q's a good severance fee, and there you go. And this is where he finds out that the contract hit is on. Mini Driver's dead, because he was a witness, and then now he's going to save him. And he's going to open up, and... 
here's the reveal <laughs> dumb fucking look there you go Mitchell Ryan Mitchell Ryan again yeah, he's a guy who was uh, the guy running jogging he's a guy from he's a bad guy and Lethal Weapon 1 Peter McAllister he was also a guy in Liar Liar the same year who Jim Terry busts in and starts calling everybody names and Mitchell Ryan's like yeah that's a gold getter <laughs> And yeah, I would say it's not really the direction that brings us to prominence. It's the 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 characters and the writing that brings it to prominence. <laughs> nice. There you go. Well, I mean, they give prominent, you know, props to the direction as well. You know, the way some of these scenes are set up are fairly nicely done. Understandable, it's not confusing, no shaky cam. Nice frying pan action. <laughs> I know we can make this relationship work after hitting some of the frying pan. <laughs> That's what I mean. It has a almost a Heather's. Like a Heather's type of black comedy state of affairs. Like Heather's is a good comparison to this compared to others. There you go. Yeah, Dan of course definitely have a lot of fun with this as well. There you go, got him real good. Interesting choice to lay down on your stomach and have the guns like this. <laughs> I 
It's also the way Dan Aykroyd, like, he has the guns, they just toss them like this when they're done. <laughs> I mean, you never think that John Hughes and Dan Aykroyd would get into, like, a two-gun pistol John Woo action scene. I think it makes it a bit more unique because of that. <laughs> there goes Hank Azaria and his partner. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go with the Dak Roid. <laughs> <laughs> the last words popcorn. <laughs> Let's see, TV on the head will do you in. Happened in stream, happened in. This is before stream. I want to say that happened before, was it uh, Mother's Day? Might have been that, or. I'm trying to think of, like the first time someone dropped a TV screen on someone's head. Maybe Mother's Day, maybe something before that. I <laughs> think just his last life. Popcorn! <laughs> now I remember there was an edit in the trailer where when he says that she still shoots at him <laughs> I think it's, it's a different way edited in the trailer I guess there were different talks of what the ending could be. Could it be this? Could it be that? And I'm like, well, just cut to this. <laughs> Forgive and just accept. And get the hell out of town. <laughs> I think Roger Ebert said he was underwhelmed by the ending, but I thought it worked. I mean, it could go in this big, long speech about this and that, but I thought just her being the car, the acceptance of the crazy situation, kind of works for its offbeat tone to the movie. And, uh, again, the fun exchanges, the crazy quirkiness of this action movie with like Benny the Jet fight scenes but then mixed in with you know John Tuesday and Dan Aykroyd doing a John Woo type of gun fight scene and it's unique it's definitely unique it's fun it's creative snappy dialogue and overall still a f fun satisfying watch still definitely my top five favorite John Cusack movies. I, yeah, I remember watching it the first time and wow, this movie's not what I expected. But it was a nice surprise and it still is to this day. And like I said, the film, when it came out, didn't make tons of money. But it definitely was a mainstay on VHS and still a satisfying film. So thanks once again, Andrew. Take care, guys, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.